I'm going to show you how to use database migrations to keep multiple instances of Superbase in sync so we can safely roll out new features for our SaaS product. We're also going to implement usage-based rules for each of our subscription tiers and lock this down with a combination of Postgres functions, Postgres triggers, and RLS policies. Let's get into it. So here we have our hosted Superbase instance. We deployed our entire SaaS to production and set up a local development environment in previous videos. So click that card above if you wanna get your project up to this point. But let's say we have someone on our team who's working directly on the production instance of Superbase. So over in the table editor, they want to add a new table for rules, which will keep a track of how many things our user can do based on their subscription tier. So before we actually create that table, if we have a look at our subscriptions, we have a subscription for a particular user. And if we scroll across, this is linked to a particular price. And if we have a look at our prices, each each price is linked to a particular product. And if we have a look at our products, so these are our different tiers of subscription. So we have hobby and we have pro. On the hobby tier, the user can do five things. And on the pro tier, the user can do 50 things. So we want to add a rules table that's gonna help us enforce that they can only do that number of things the things that they're gonna be able to do in this example are gonna be writing notes. So this will be a note taking app, something like an extremely simplified version of Notion. So let's create that new table for rules. We're going to leave enable row level security ticked, but we'll talk more about RLS soon. And for our columns, we can leave these ID and created at columns. And then we want to add a new column for our product underscore ID. And so this is going to link each of the rows in our rules table to a particular product. So we want to set up a foreign key relationship on the public schema. The table we want to reference is products. And so on our public dot rules table, we want the product underscore ID column to reference the public dot products tables ID column. And this is telling us it's going to automatically set the type for our new product underscore ID column to be text. So that will match the ID of the public dot products table. And if we scroll down, we can specify what we want to happen if that row is updated in the products table or if it's removed. If it's updated and it affects our rules table, so essentially if the ID is updated, then we want to raise an error. And if it's removed entirely, we want to cascade those deletes. So deleting a record from the public.products table will also delete any of the records that reference it in this rules table. So let's click save to add that foreign key relationship relationship and on our product underscore ID column, we see this cog, we want to click it and untick is nullable. So we want every rule to reference a product in the products table. We don't ever want this field to be null and we also want it to be unique. So we only want one rule for every product. So this sets up what's called a one-to-one -one relationship between these two tables. So every product can only have one rule and every rule can only be associated with one product. Then we want to add another column for the notes underscore allowed. So this is how many notes the user is allowed to add based on the product or subscription tier that they're currently on. So this one's going to be an integer. I imagine this number is probably gonna be pretty small. So an int two is probably totally safe. And let's click this cog to say we don't ever want this column to be nullable as we always want to be enforcing a particular number of notes that are allowed for every product. Now let's click save to create that new table. And then we can insert a new row for each of our products. So we can click select product to look up the rows in our products table. And so for the hobby tier, the notes allowed are five. And let's click save to insert that new row. And then insert a new row for our pro tier where the notes allowed are 50 and click save to add that new rule. So this new rules table and the changes to our schema have been made directly on the production instance of Superbase. So how do we get these changes out to all of our local development environments for each of the users that are working on our SaaS product? We can use Superbase to analyze any changes that have happened to our schema and automatically generate migration files to keep everything in sync. We can see this init migration, which is used to set up all of the Stripe stuff, but we're not yet tracking those new schema changes to add our rules table. So let's spin up our local development environment and create that migration. So I already have this open in VS Code, but click that card above 
to configure this entire local development stack. To get it up and running, I'm gonna run pmpm stripe colon listen, and this gives us a new signing secret. So I'm gonna copy this, open up our .env .local file, update the value for our stripe webhook secret, give that one a save, and then in a new terminal process, run pmpm superbase colon start. And remember, you'll need Docker running to run this superbase start command. And now we can open up our studio URL, which we'll need in a little bit. And then to run our Next.js app, we can clear this out and run pmpm dev. And we can open up localhost over port 3000 and see our SaaS app running in the browser. We've got each of those pricing plans for monthly or yearly billing, and we're currently signed in and under account, we can see we're not currently subscribed to any plan. And if we have a look at our local instance of the Superbase Studio and go over to the table editor, we can see all of those tables for keeping Superbase in sync with Stripe, but we don't have that new rules table from the hosted production version of Superbase. In order for our local instance of Superbase to be able to talk to our hosted production instance and push and pull those migration files, we need to link them together. So back over in our terminal, this one's still running our next JS app. So let's create a new instance where we can run pmpm superbase colon link. And this is going to list out my absolutely ludicrous number of superbase projects. So I can press slash to filter this down and type subscription. And I'm pretty sure it was this second one for subscription starter demo. So let's link our local instance to that hosted Superbase instance. And we need its database password, which I remember telling you to copy to a password manager, but I forgot. So we can easily reset this back over in our hosted instance of Superbase. So this one's running on localhost, whereas this is our hosted version on superbase.com. So if we go over to settings and then database, and then scroll down to database password and click reset database password, click here to generate a secure password and make sure you copy that one to a password manager and then click reset password. And now back over in the terminal, paste that one in. We won't actually see any feedback when we paste it, but when we click enter, we'll see that's finished the Superbase link. So now we can run pmpm Superbase colon pull, and this will create a shadow database, which will spin up a new Superbase instance and run our existing migrations. It will then compare the state of that against our hosted production version of Superbase and automatically generate a migration file to take it from this state to this state. So essentially, add our rules table. So this is asking if we want to update the remote migration history table, which we do. So let's say yes. And now if we have a look in our Superbase folder under migrations, we now have this first migration to add all of that Stripe stuff. And now we have a new migration to add our rules table. And if we go back to our hosted production version of our Superbase Studio and go over to database and then look at migrations, we'll see that a new migration has been added to our remote hosted version of Superbase. So now any other devs who are working on our SaaS product can pull down those schema changes and also have that rules table. And if we have a look at the local instance of our Superbase Studio, so running locally on 127.0.0.1, we can see all of our Stripe tables are still there, but we don't yet have a rules table. And this is because we created those migrations, but we haven't actually run it against our local instance. So if we clear this out and run pmpm Superbase colon migration dash up and now our local Superbase instance has that rules table and its schema is now completely in sync with our hosted production instance, but we don't have any of the data. So migrations track schema changes, but not data, which is a good thing. We probably shouldn't be duplicating production data onto all of our devs local machines, especially when we have real customers with real PII. So we can just create those rules again. So we can insert a row and click select record to choose our hobby plan. And the notes allowed for this one are five. Let's click save to insert that new rule and then insert another one for our pro plan where the notes allowed are 50 and click save to insert that one. So we've created some rules for the number of things the user is able to do on each of those subscription tiers. Now let's create the things we actually want to restrict. So in this case, that's gonna be notes. So let's create a new table called notes. We'll leave RLS enabled. And then for the columns, we want to add a column for the actual content of our note. And the type for this one is going to be text. And then we want another column for user underscore ID. And we'll click this little chain here to set up a foreign key relationship on the public schema. The table we want to reference is users and the column 
is ID. And again, we can choose what happens to this note when its user is updated or removed. If it's removed, we want to cascade those deletes. So if the user is deleted, so are their notes. And let's click save to set up that relationship and then click this cog and untick is nullable because we want every note to have a user that owns it. So let's click save to create that table and then let's insert some notes for our current user. So that's John and the content can be like this video and subscribe to the channel. And you can actually do that right now. You don't even need to write a note, just click those below. And let's click save to create that note and then add another one. And again, select the record for John and the content can be follow John Myers underscore IO on Twitter. That's one you could do now too. And then click save to add that note. And we want some notes that belong to another user, which we don't actually have yet. So we can go over to authentication and then under users, we can add a user. And since this is just gonna be for test purposes, we can create it directly rather than sending an invitation to a real user. So let's create a new user. This one is going to be thought at superbase.com. The password can be something super secure and we want to auto confirm this user because again, this is just for testing locally. So let's create that user. And now back over in the table editor, we can go to our notes and then insert a new row and select our other user whose full name is null because we didn't get all of this extra information from GitHub, but this one is our Thor user. We can then add a note for Thor, like do thunder strike, something Thor-like and then click save. And so now that we have some data that belongs to different users, let's implement some authorization rules so that users are only able to see the notes that they own. So we can check which notes our users are able to see by changing this role from our Postgres role, which is used by the Superbase Studio and has admin privileges and bypasses row level security or RLS policies to our non role, which represents a user that's not logged in or our authenticated role, which allows us to impersonate either of our users. So let's impersonate John and then interestingly, even though John owns two of those nodes, he can't actually see them. And this is because we enabled row level security or RLS on the notes table. And by default, RLS automatically denies any action on that table. So no one can select, insert, update, or delete. If we wanna enable any of those actions, we just need to write a policy. So back over under authentication and then policies, we can see RLS is enabled for the notes table, but no policies have been created yet. So let's create a new policy. There are some templates to help you get started, but for this one, we're gonna go full customization and create a policy from scratch. The name of our policy is going to be users can read their notes. It's going to enable the select action. And now if we just want to enable read access for everyone, we can leave this type target roles as public. And then under our using expression, we need to write an expression that either evaluates to true or false. So it could be a mathematical expression like five plus five equals nine, which would obviously evaluate to false. But this expression will be checked for every single row that the user is trying to select from the notes table. So if this does evaluate to false, then RLS will continue denying access to this particular row. If it evaluated to true, like five plus five equals 10, that's going to be a true statement, then the user would be able to select this particular note. So rather than a mathematical equation, which is always going to evaluate to true or false, we want to check whether the user underscore ID column of that particular note is equal to the result of the auth.uid function, which is a special superbase function that gives us back the currently signed in user. So this will be checked against every row in the notes table. And if the user ID column of that particular note matches the user who's trying to select Select it, then they will be allowed to select it. Otherwise, RLS will just continue denying it. Also, since the auth.uid function means this rule requires the user to be authenticated, we can change the target roles to only target the authenticated role, meaning it won't even bother evaluating this expression if the user is not signed in. So let's click review to see the SQL that's been generated from each of those fields, and then save policy to run that SQL against our Postgres database. Now, if we go back to the table, Table editor and select our notes. This has automatically set our role back to Postgres so we can see all of those notes. But if we change our role 
to the anon role, so the user is not logged in, we see that none of those notes have been selected. And if we change the role to the authenticated role and impersonate our John user, we'll see we can only select the rows where the user ID column is set to our John user. And if we go back to notes and instead choose to impersonate our Thor user, so let's stop impersonating John and instead impersonate Thor, we can only see that one note for Thor. But what about adding or inserting a new note? This is slightly more complicated as we're mixing some security and some business logic. On the security side, we want the user to be authenticated and only be able to insert a new note that belongs to them. On the business logic side, we want them to have an active subscription and only be able to insert a note if they're under that usage threshold for their particular subscription tier. It's recommended you separate these two concerns and use RLS policies for security logic and something like Postgres triggers and functions for business logic. So we're gonna do exactly that. So firstly, we can confirm that we can't actually insert a row as one of our signed in users. So we're currently impersonating that Thor user. So we can select them from our users table. And then for our content, we can say will not work and click save to confirm that this will not work because the new row violates row level security policy for table notes. So let's write a policy to enable this insert action. We can discard these changes and then back over under authentication and policies, we want a new policy for our notes table. We're gonna create this one from scratch. The name is gonna be authenticated user can insert their own note. This is going to enable the insert operation. Again, we want the target roles to be set to authenticated because we need our user to be signed in. And then the expression we want to check is that the user underscore ID column matches the result of the auth.uid function. So to insert a new note, the user needs to be authenticated and the user ID column of the note they are inserting needs to match their ID. So no inserting notes for other users. Let's click review to see that SQL and then save policy to run it. And now back over in the table editor, if we go to the notes table and change our role back to the authenticated role, impersonating our John user, we can see those two existing notes. And if we insert a new row, selecting the record of our John user with the content, this one will work and click save, we'll see that new note has been successfully inserted into the database. But if we come over to our subscriptions, we don't currently have a subscription. So really our John user shouldn't be able to insert any notes. But since this is business logic and likely to change in the future as we adjust our pricing model and maybe those different usage tiers for each of our subscriptions, we don't want this baked into our security model using RLS policies. So let's create a Postgres function and a trigger that can check these values as the user's trying to insert a new note. So let's go over to database and then functions and create a new function called handle new note. So this will run anytime a new note is being inserted. It's going to be on the public schema. The return type is going to be trigger. This allows us to run it on insert. We don't need any arguments. And in the definition, we need to wrap the body of our function in a begin and end. So we want to check a few things in here. Firstly, that the user's subscription is active. Then we want to count their existing notes, then check that the number of notes is less than the threshold of their subscription. And then if everything's all good, we want to return the new variable, which represents the new note that the user is trying to insert. Meaning if we hit this return statement, then everything's all good and the user is allowed to add that new note. So let's start by getting the user's subscription. Since Postgres functions use PLPGSQL. This means we get access to some programmy things like being able to declare variables. So let's create one for the user's subscription. And the type for this one is going to be our subscriptions table. And then we can do percentage row type all in caps, which will allow us to store the entire user's subscription row, which we'll need for multiple steps in our validation logic. So let's select the user's subscription by saying select star into our subscription variable from the table subscriptions where the user underscore ID column is equal to the result of the auth.uid function. So now we should have the row for our user's subscription in this subscription variable or it will be null. So we can check if the subscription is null or subscription.status does not equal an active subscription, then we want 
want to raise an exception that user is not subscribed or has exceeded the usage of their current tier. And then we can end if, and now we can create the function at this point to test this part of our validation logic is working. We also need a semicolon here. So we're getting the user's subscription. And then if they don't have a subscription or the subscription status does not equal active, then we're raising an exception or throwing an error. So we'll implement counting their existing notes and checking it's under that threshold soon. But if we hit this return new statement, so essentially this exception is not raised, then we'll be able to create our new note. We also need to toggle on show advanced settings and scroll down and then rather than security invoker, we want to set this to security definer. So this just determines the level of privileges that this function has when it's called. Security invoker will be called on behalf of the user and security definer will be called on behalf of our admin user who's currently logged in. So since we want to bypass RLS, because this is a system action or a system check to see whether the user should be allowed to actually do this action, we want it to be security definer. And let's click confirm to create that database function. And this has failed to create that database function, undefined, super helpful error. But after some debugging off camera, I realized all the way at the top, I spelt subscriptions incorrectly. So let's make sure we add that extra S and then confirm. And now we have our handle new note function, which returns a trigger. So let's go over to triggers to subscribe to that insert event. So let's click create a new trigger. The name of this one is going to be on insert note. The table we want to listen to changes on is the public dot notes table. The event we want to listen to is insert. We want this trigger to happen before the event and for orientation, we want this to be run for every row that is affected by the statement. So if a single statement is inserting multiple notes, we want this trigger function to run for each of those new rows. And then the function that we want to trigger is somewhere in this list. So under the public schema, it's the handle new note function. And let's click confirm to set up that trigger. So a trigger is like a subscription to a particular event on a particular table. So we're saying anytime the insert action happens on the notes table, first we want to call this Postgres function and check the validity of that user and the note they're trying to insert. So if they have an active subscription and they're within the bounds of their current subscription tier in terms of how many notes they can add, then all good. Otherwise, we raise that exception, throw it up in the air, and that stops the process so the user isn't able to add that new note. So let's go over to the table editor and the notes table. Let's change our role back to the authenticated role and impersonate our John user. And then let's try to insert a new row. Let's select the record for our John user. And then the content can be, will this work? Well, what do you think? Do you think this is gonna work? Let's click save and we see this big scary error saying user is not subscribed or exceeded the usage of their current tier. Hey, we wrote that exception. That's the one we raised. So we can't actually insert that note because we don't have an active subscription. So let's discard this one and then back over in our Next.js app, we can go over to pricing and subscribe to this hobby plan, which takes us through the Stripe checkout page, which we can see is using those fake credentials. So let's subscribe. And now we can see our ring around that hobby plan. And if we go to account, we can see we're on the hobby plan at $20 a month. And back over in the Superbase Studio under subscriptions, we can see our new subscription for our John user and the status is currently active. So we should now be able to insert a new note selecting the record for our John user and the content. I think this will work. The exclamation point makes it sound more confident. So let's save that one. And we can see that one has been correctly inserted into our notes table. So if we go over to subscriptions and we change our status from active to let's say paused, ah, we can't do that as our John user. So let's drop down that role and change it to the Postgres role, which has admin privileges and bypasses RLS. And then we can change our status from active to paused. And now if we go over to the notes table and again, impersonate our John user and try to insert a new note for our John user with the content. I don't think this will work question mark and then scroll down and click save. We see that same exception is raised because the user is either not subscribed or has exceeded the usage of their current tier. So let's implement this second condition in our Postgres function. Let's just set our subscription back to active so we don't forget. So again, we need to change this to the Postgres role, change our subscription up to active. And now if we go to database and 
then functions, we can click these three dots on our handle new note function and edit that function without needing to change any of the settings of our function or that trigger that's listening to insert events on the notes table. So we've confirmed that this is working correctly. If the subscription is null or the status column is anything other than active, then this exception is raised, meaning we never actually create that new note. So let's implement these other checks to make sure the user should be able to insert that note. So to count their existing notes, we need a place to store them. So let's declare a new variable for number of notes, which is going to be an int. And then we can select the count of star from the notes table where the user underscore ID column is equal to the auth.uid function. So this will give us back that count. So then we need to put it into something so we can put it into our number of notes variable. We then need to work out the threshold for our user's subscription. So let's declare a new variable called notes allowed for subscription tier. And this is also going to be an integer. So this one will be a fun one because we know we can select the notes underscore allowed column from our rules table. And we can put that into our notes allowed allowed for subscription tier variable, but we need to specify where the product underscore ID is equal to the product the user is currently subscribed to. So maybe this will be clearer if we step through our actual schema. So I'm just gonna duplicate this so I don't mess with that function definition. And then over in the table editor, we're selecting from the rules table. So the value we want to get at the end is this notes allowed column. So either five or 50, but this depends on a specific product. So how are we gonna work out which product the user is currently subscribed to? Well, we already have their subscription, but if we have a look at the columns for this one, we have a price, but we don't have a product. So we need to find out the product from the price table. So if we have a look at our prices, that's how we get access to our product. So since we already have the user's subscription stored in that variable in our Postgres function, we could select the product ID from the prices table where the ID matches our user's subscriptions price ID. Hopefully that made sense. We're getting a little tricky and maybe a bit advanced here, but if that didn't make sense, it's fine. You can just rewind the video, go back, watch it again, do that as many times as you want. So back over in our Postgres function, we're selecting that column from the rules table. We're storing it in our variable, which we'll use later to check whether the user has exceeded their threshold, but we only want the notes allowed column for the rule where the product ID matches that whole chain of stuff we just talked about. So we can use a subquery by adding these parentheses, and then we can select the product underscore ID column from the prices table, so now that we've got product ID here and product ID here, we need to be a little more specific and say, this is the product ID from the rules table. And this is the product ID from the prices table. So we want the product ID from the prices table where the prices.id is equal to our subscription.price underscore ID. And now we don't need a semicolon on this subquery, but we do need one here. And so now we need to do this actual check. So we want to say if the number of notes is greater than the notes allowed for subscription tier, then we want to raise an exception saying number of notes exceeds subscription tier, which means we can fix up our other exception to just say user is not subscribed because that covers if their subscription is null or their subscription status is not active. And so this exception is more clear as to what's happened. And then this exception explains that the number of notes exceeds their subscription tier. So let's put a semicolon there and end this if and another semicolon. And now let's click confirm to update that function. And now if we go back over to the table editor and look at our notes with the role set to our authenticated role and impersonate our John user, we'll see that we conveniently have four notes. And if we check the rules for our hobby tier, we're only allowed five notes. So let's go back to the notes table, change the role to our authenticated role, impersonate John, and try to insert a new row for our John user with the content. This will totally work. And scroll down to click 
save, and we'll see that note's successfully been inserted. But now that we have five notes, let's try to insert a new row for our John user with the content, this will not work, and try to click save, and this one has inserted. So let's try to insert another row for our John user, and the content can be surely not. And let's click save, and we get this number of notes exceeds subscription tier. We're just off by one. So let's go back to database, and then functions, and then edit our handle new note function. And if we scroll down, we can see we're checking whether our number of notes is already greater than the notes allowed for that subscription tier. But since this is running before that new note is inserted, we want this to be greater than or equal to the notes allowed for the subscription tier. So let's confirm these changes to our function. And now if we go back over to the table editor and go to notes and make sure we're using the Postgres role so we can delete the last two notes we added. So let's delete those two rows. And yes, we're sure. Now let's change our role back to the authenticated role and impersonate our John user. And now we can see we have our four notes. So we should be able to insert a new note for our John user with the content. This should definitely work and replace should with will because we're feeling extra confident and then scroll down and click save. And that note has been successfully added. So let's insert another row for our John user with which will definitely not work. And then let's scroll down and click save and we get our exception because this new note exceeds the number of notes for our user's subscription tier. But if I were to go back to our Next.js app and open up the customer portal, updating my current plan to be pro and scrolling down to click continue and confirming those changes. Now, when I go back to our Next.js app, I can see I'm on the pro plan, which means without any other changes, I can close this exception that we got last time and then add this new note and it's successfully inserted into the notes table because I'm now on that higher subscription tier and can therefore add 50 notes. So we've made a significant amount of changes to our local Superbase instance. We created a new table for our notes, we added RLS policies, we created a Postgres function and a Postgres trigger. So how do we get those changes up to our production instance? Let's create a migration. So back over in the terminal, let's run pmpm superbase colon generate dash migration, and then we need to give it a name. So in this case, add underscore notes, and you'll see this is creating another shadow database, which is spinning up a new superbase instance, running those existing migrations, diffing those schemas, and then creating a new migration to bring it up to the state of our local instance with that new table, RLS policies, Postgres functions, and triggers. And we can have a look at that new Superbase migration. So it's just an SQL file that creates a table for notes, enables RLS, adds an index for the primary key, and then, you know, everything else, all of this stuff we did. So let's run that migration against our hosted production instance. So we can clear this one away and say pmpm superbase colon push. And this has connected to our remote database and applied this new migration, which we can confirm by going to our hosted Superbase instance and under database and migrations, we can see that new migration to add notes. And over in the table editor, we can see our notes table, which is currently empty. So we can change our role to the authenticated role and impersonate our John user. We can then try to insert a new note for that John user with the content like and subscribe if you haven't yet. I mean, come on, you stuck around to this point. You obviously like the content. Click that like button, click subscribe, click the notification bell, and you can see more videos like this this. But do we think this is going to work? Let's click save and we get user is not subscribed. Well, let's go check our subscriptions table. So over in subscriptions, we can see our subscription, which was active at one point, but is currently incomplete underscore expired. So let's change our role back to the Postgres role and then drop this down and change it to an active subscription. Make sure you don't actually change values in your production instance. Just watch me change values in my production instance to show that this works. So now that we have an active subscription, we should also check which price we're on and which product it links to. So we're currently on the hobby tier, which if we look at our rules means we are allowed to insert five notes. So now back over in our notes table, let's change the role to authenticated and impersonate our John user. And now when we insert a new row for our John user with the content, this will totally work and click save, we can see it totally 
totally did work. And if we insert another row for our John user with just some random content and save, and then insert another row for our John user with some random content and save, and then insert another row for our John user with random content and click save. Oh, we're getting close. Now we can insert another row for our John user with some random content and click save. And now we have our five notes. So if we try to insert another row for our John user with the content, this will not work and click save. We get an exception that the number of notes exceeds our subscription tier. So if we make any changes to our schema, we can track these in migration files and roll them out to production when we're ready to launch that feature. But we're rolling them out directly to production. That's probably not great. We should be spinning up a staging instance of Superbase so we can heavily test every feature we're working on before it makes it to production. But for that one, you'll need to check out this video right here. We use branching and Superbase's GitHub integration to automate the process of creating a Superbase instance for every branch in GitHub. If you just want to see what else is possible with this super awesome SaaS stack, then you should totally check out this playlist. It contains all of the videos about Next.js, Superbase, and Stripe. But until next time, keep building cool stuff.